Welcome back to Medicine Made Easy with me, Kavya Chandral. Now we will be discussing the last topic of intracranial complication of CSYM and that is lateral sinus thrombophlebitis. Before we actually go into the topic, if you have not subscribed our channel, do subscribe for regular video updates and also plus press the bell icon. If you have not watched the previous videos, all the links for that uh, videos relating to the CSYM complications are in the description. And if you have not followed our Instagram page, the link for the Instagram page is in the description you can follow. I am regularly posting the outline of whatever video we are discussing there in the Instagram page. This video particular that is on uh, lateral sinus thrombophlebitis discussion is more brief rather than a, a concise part because understanding of this is very important and uh, the note for this the outline for this will be posted in Instagram page as well if you don't have access to Instagram page or if you are not using Instagram and given the uh, notes as the link which is in the description you can check it out you can download from that drive link also so let us get started with this topic of lateral sinus thrombophlebitis do you know what is the other term which we use synonymously for lateral sinus thrombophlebitis yes it is sigmoid sinus thrombosis so lateral sinus thrombophlebitis or sigmoid sinus thrombosis are used synonymously before we actually study this topic and discuss this topic we have to know the basic idea about the dural venous sinus which is in relation to the ear let us uh, discuss that and here is the diagram which we have already seen in previous video also this is dural venous sinus and CSOM that is how CSOM is affecting the dural venous sinus um, into the picture. Now here is the sigmoid sinus and jugular bulb. The sigmoid sinus and jugular bulb is actually related to floor of the middle ear and uh, whenever the inflammation infection is present in the middle ear it is going to uh, spread through the uh, veins which is, in, which is a part of dural venous sinus. Now what are all the things it can involve? Because we know the pathology is retrograde thrombophilibitis, it can involving start from the sigmoid sinus, transverse sinus till the suprasacral sinus, it can even involve um, not directly but at least indirectly as a part of sequen, sequelae of this involvement, there can be uh, cavernous sinus symptoms also. So this is to be noted. Now having this idea in mind of retrograde thrombophilibitis, Sigmoid sinus is being involved and the anatomy of dural venous sinus. Let us get started with lateral sinus thrombophlebitis. Okay, now coming to the discussion proper. Lateral sinus thrombophlebitis is something to deal with dural venous sinus. Now we are dealing on chronic separative otitis media. It means ear and uh, venous sinus. Dural venous sinus is connected. Now how, what makes it involved is the acute coalescent mastoiditis masked mastoiditis, CSYM and cholesteatoma. These are all the factors or the or the pathology that is going to cause lateral sinus thrombophlebitis as a complication. Now how to, how it all is happening? Simple. Let us uh, focus on the diagram. Now what is happening? There is mastoiditis, there is CSYM or cholesteatoma which is present and this is relating to the vein, the sigmoid sinus. There is inflammation first to the outer wall, the walls that is perisinus abscess. Next what happens? The inner wall is affected that is the endophilibitis because of the inflammation of the endothelium you know the witch of striate right so injury to the endothelium is predisposing to thrombosis and that's why there is a thrombus and this thrombus is going to cause obstruction of the lumen and at one point of time this thrombus is upsetting the lumen as well it is progressive and it can dislodge a small piece that is an embolite to the distant part this is the basic uh, sequelae what is happening infection perisinus abscess endophilibitis and there is mural thrombi and there is progression of thrombus and embolization is happening. Now on the due course what are the symptoms the patient is going to say a present. Now here initially they can, the person can present with ear symptom but later he is going to present with mild headache. Now though mild headache is present even in ear symptom we are going to uh, say specifically it is for sigma sinus thrombosis but still there is an next day headache is relating to the posterior uh, part that is occipital region. Next what is happening on the progression of disease that can be progressive anemia and emaciation. Now as the disease is very 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 progressing to the stage of uh, progressive mural thrombus there is uh, irregular hectic picket fence fever. Why this fever is happening? It is whenever uh, 
emboli which is released from the thrombus the time of the release there is an hectic picket fence fever now doesn't it look similar to a very common disease yes it is similar to malaria where whenever there is um, bursting out of the erythrocyte through which the sesoint is going to enter the blood there is spike of fever and same here whenever the emboli is released from the thrombus there is a fever so this is one differential but how to differentiate this uh, malaria or this let us say this thrombophlebitis blood investigation by blood screening we can do and clinically uh, it is like regularly if it is happening the fever it is malaria if it is irregular it is let us say this thrombophlebitis okay now remember it is an infective etiology from infection this thrombus is formed it means it could be a septic emboli so by giving antibiotics this incidence can be reduced and apart from that we can do a blood culture to find which organism it is uh, causing and last whenever there is a progressive thrombi obstruction in the lumen there can be severe headache now what else can happen because of this uh, thrombus there is dislodgement of the emboli into the mastoidal mesh vein because of this obstruction what happens there is an edema which is present in the mastoid and this is called grissinger sign if you are feeling difficult to remember grissinger sign or if you are confused to uh, to remember this uh, sign just remember like this this is an edematous mastoid so this curvature and this g sigmoid sinus did you get the content of g see it is like a g yes so this is for grissinger sign remember grissinger sign is something to do with this edematous mastoid which is the posterior region because of the mastoid emission vein involvement this is basically found by doing an x-ray mastoid where we can see cloudy air cell and destruction if it is if it is a cholestatoma being present now other features see this is the dural venous sinus system now here is the thrombus and this thrombus is now going to embolize from here the emboli is reaching the suprasagittal sinus because of this reaching suprasagittal sinus what can happen the um arachnoid villi function is affected so it can lead to what is called as otitic hydrocephalus and now because of the thrombi being present here the blood flow here which is affected the drainage is affected and because of that there is engorgement of the retinal vein here and person can show switches of papillary edema and apart from that because of the thrombi which is present in sigmoid sinus it can be seen as a delta sign on invest on uh, mri and ct on ct if we take on a axial cut section posterior vein fossa we can see a ring enhancement lesion within which there is a central low density which is giving a sign of delta sign which is actually corresponding to the thrombi which is present in the sigmoid sinus remember delta sign next this in this is an infection so probably it can involve the internal jugular veins uh, nodes so the jugular nodes are inflamed and the person can have torticollis that is called rhinic next we are coming to two important test that is called as toby air test and crobex sign toby air test remember it is a test where in which we are going to manually compress the internal uh, jugular vein so whenever you are going to compress that vein if at all there is an obstruction in the vein what happens the pressure is not going to increase yes for sure intracranial pressure but if at all we obstruct uh, we manually compress the internal jugular vein on the opposite side that is normal side there is increased intracranial pressure that is actually equal to bilateral igv compression okay so what does this signify is the csf examination would be normal but the pressure of the csf will be increased it could be increased and even on examination also we are going to find the same this is called as toby air sign so you manually compress uh, internal um, icp will not increase on the side of obstruction ic will increase on the side of um, on the side of normal vein next come into crobex sign so crobex sign is very simple as we already said because the pressure which is we give on the uh, internal jugular vein we can see the engorgement of the retinal vein through ophthalmic scopic finding that is called as crobex sign so you give a pressure on the igv and we can see the retinal vein getting engorged this is called crobex sign now coming to complications so what are the complications because of the sigmoid sinus being involved here there can be and it is infective also 
there can be infection which is passing posteriorly to the cerebellum so it's not cerebral cerebellar abscess it can result in meningitis or subdural abscess it can involve as the interjugular vein is involved the course of the interjugular vein is accompanied by 19 level cranial nerves that can be due to all of these and we have already spoken to the arachnoid villi if it is involving that is superficial sinus if it is the pathology extending the arachnoid villi is going to involve and it results in otitic hydrocephalus and whenever there is cavernous sinus involvement that is called that is resulting in cavernous sinus thrombosis this is all the expected complications the committee treatment very simple as it is an infective pathology we are giving IV antibiotics and um, it can do mastodectomy and uh, clear the sinus uh, drain, uh, drain of all the abscess we can drain see first what you do by mastodectomy you can remove the sinus plate to export this dura and we can drain the perisinus abscess if at all we have an intrasinus abscess or a clot being present what to do very simple now what to do there is a dura before you incise the dura remember we just an vein now uh, this is a vascular structure we are going to keep the hand on we are going to operate on so it, it will bleed for sure so because of that in keeping in mind we are keeping a pack between the bone the dura and by doing that above and below we are stabilizing and if we reduce the bleeding because of pack keeping between a bone and a dura and then we are going to make an incision on the dura and we are going to wall and that drain, drain that uh, abscess of the clot and you need to take the pack after day 5 or day 6 of post-operative day and after taking the pad you can do secondary wound closure apart from that that uh, the practice of internal jugular vein ligation anticoagulations are rarely used and supportive therapies that is for correction of anemia and maintaining stable uh, stabilizing the vitals are also being done so i hope i made this topic clear and i as i've already said i will give the notes in the in form of the drive link which is present in the description you can check it out and before i uh, conclude there is something called M, uh, MR venography which shows the resolution and progression of the pathology here that is sigma sinus thrombosis and we can do an ear swab culture and sensitivity for the organism for initiating the antibiotics. So hope you all enjoyed this video and learned something from this video which is an important topic of latent sinus thrombophilibitis. If you like the video you can share to your friends and let's all learn together and We'll meet you in the next video. Till then, stay tuned. Bye.